Good evening and welcome to the U.S. Embassy's Exchange Alumni Stories with our Fulbright alumni. It is wonderful to have you join us tonight on our virtual live stream. Thank you for joining us on Facebook as well. Welcome to an exciting program that we have lined up for you with our amazing alumni that are joining us this evening. To get us started, I'd like to introduce to you U.S. Embassy's Regional Public Affairs Officer, Stephanie Fitzmorris. Thank you, Maggie, and good evening and welcome to the U.S. Embassy's fourth exchange alumni event. We're so happy that so many of you could join us virtually this evening to learn about the Fulbright Foreign Student Program. The Fulbright Foreign Student Program is the U.S. Embassy's flagship educational exchange. It's named after American Senator William Fulbright, and the program seeks to increase mutual understanding between the people of the United States and other countries. Participants are chosen for academic merit and their leadership potential. And through their studies, they can work towards finding solutions to shared international challenges. The Fulbright Foreign Student Program is a fully funded master's degree program for study at a university in the United States. And it's open to all the countries that our two embassies now are accredited to. So for us here at U.S. Embassy Suva, that's Fiji, Kiribati, Nauru, and Tuvalu. And we hope we have um, viewers joining us tonight from Tonga, where our new U.S. Embassy Nukualofa um, is offering this program. Um, while I have you all here, I wanted to respond to uh, a question that we often hear as people are applying to the Fulbright program. They ask us which English test they need to take for their application. The good news is you don't need to take any English test right now, either the TOEFL or IELTS. Applicants who successfully pass the interview stage and are selected as finalists um, are then we will notify you at that point in the process that you need to take the TOEFL test and then the embassy will pay for it. So don't worry about that right now. Um, and I also want to preview for all of you that there's another program that will be opening up applications for next month. That's called the Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowship, and it offers a one year fully funded exchange also open to citizens of all five countries. And the Humphrey program uh, offers a chance to both do some study in the United States and get work experience in your field. The Humphrey program is for professionals who have at least five years of work experience. And it, although it does not confer a degree uh, because of that work experience component, it's a truly valuable and prestigious exchange opportunity. So if you are interested in these exchange programs or other scholarships and exchanges through the U.S. Embassy, I encourage you all to follow our U.S. Embassy Suva accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and U.S. Embassy Nukualofa on Facebook, and tell your friends too. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Maggie Boyle to lead what I'm sure will be an interesting and exciting discussion tonight. Thank you all again for joining us and back over to you, Maggie. Thank you, Stephanie, for laying the groundwork of this amazing scholarship program that we have on offer. And being a flagship program, we've got some amazing women who've led this flagship program, two of which have graduated, one as a part of the current um, enrollment. So we'd like to invite you all. Thank you again if you're tuning in to our live stream on Facebook. It's the U.S. Embassy's Exchange Alumni Stories, and we are here tonight with Fulbright alumni. We'd like to welcome them all. We've got from Fiji, we've got Anna Tuikite joining us. We've also got Lisefa Paenu from Tuvalu. Talofa, Lisefa, thank you for joining us. And all the way from Tonga, but currently in North Carolina, Elisabeth Vekoso. Malo Elele, and good morning on your end. Good evening, of course, to our audience. Ladies, thank you for joining us this evening. Let's start with Lisefa, who is, of course, our graduate from 2015. Lisefa, tell us about the program for you and what you studied in brief. Uh, Maggie, so I am the 2014-2015 um, award recipient, and I went to the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, so very cold, 
um, and I studied a master's of international human rights law. Thank you, Ms. Ipan. And we'll have more questions, of course, to come back to you with. All the way in uh, Totoya, Anna, who uh, is our graduate of, from last year. Anna, tell us a little bit about the program you were involved in. Yes, Bula, um, Malom Bula from Totoya in Laos. I was at Pepperdine University, the Caruso School of Law. I graduated uh, with an LLM Master's in Dispute Resolution and International Commercial Law. Thank you, Anna. And of course, in North Carolina and all the way from the kingdom, Elisa Petty, if you could tell us about the program you're currently enrolled in. Hello, Lily. Uh, I've just briefly acknowledged my tongue and heritage there, Maggie, according to protocol. So now I would like to um, introduce myself. Um, I am from Tonga, and currently I'm here at University of North Carolina in Wilmington doing a master's in coastal and ocean policy. Uh, it's a two-year program, and I started last semester, and this is my second semester. Hopefully, I'm going to finish next semester in May. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, we're going to follow that kind of arrangement. We'll go to Lisette for now. Lisette, why Fulbright? Uh, thanks, Maggie. Well, I think the better question is why not? Um, as we've heard, uh, this is the US's best scholarship. So I feel that for those looking into progressing their career, especially in the field of leadership, um, this is the best you can hope for from the US. So yeah, I encourage everyone to apply for, for Fulbright for those reasons specifically, because we really do get um, all these opportunities, all these amazing um, funding opportunities, as well as the fancy cocktails at the embassies and the dinners that we get invited to. So it, we really do become a, a prestigious group. You certainly are. And that same question for you, what drew you to apply to the Fulbright program? Uh, for the area of law that I applied for in uh, Fulbright was dispute resolution. And I had the opportunity, I was given the opportunity to attend the number one university in the US for dispute resolution. And so Fulbright was a bridge to help me achieve that dream. Another reason why Fulbright is not only the values that Fulbright carries, but it's got an international alumni that's just not only full of knowledge and network, but it makes you um, appreciate not only diversity, excellence in learning, uh, it also assists you in your leadership skills. Uh, depending on the university that one picks, there's so many opportunities uh, in the US for other uh, programs from the program that you picked and other opportunities that present Thank you, Anna. And Elizabeth, the same question to you, what drew you to apply for the Fulbright program? And of course, you're doing something very topical in this region, your study in uh, coastal and ocean policy. Thank you. Um, I think first of all, um, Fulbright scholarship was, is, is not really um, a common scholarship that I've heard many people apply to in Tonga. So I wanted to challenge myself and, you know, just give it a go and apply. And I think one of the, of the reasons um, that I was drawn to this scholarship was um, the programs that they gave. Um, I saw the, um, the, uh, the programs, um, ocean policy was listed in it because at the time I was doing something on marine special planning. So I was, um, you know, I was interested to, to learn more about ocean policy. So I was like, you know, I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll just apply and see if, if, you know, if I can go in this scholarship. And um, of course, the United States have, you know, the best to offer in education. So it was more of a challenge to me uh, to apply for um, Fulbright. We've had so 
many uh, opportunities, you know, through Australia and New Zealand. And um, I was like, okay, maybe I'll go for the Fulbright. And I tried and I'm here. So it was more of a challenge. And I love, now that I'm here, I love the program. I love the school that I picked. And like Anna has mentioned, uh, this school has, um, is offering the best in this, in the program that I'm here and, um, on ocean policy. So um, I'm really glad for that opportunity. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth, if we can go to you, having attained your master's in human rights law, how have, having completed the Fulbright program, how has that progressed your, your um, professional development? Well, given that there's not many of us with this qualification, it really puts me in a better position to apply for jobs. And um, specifically, I guess I tuned in my focus to NGO work back home because um, I felt that I could do a lot more in the NGO sector since it's very underdeveloped or it's still developing. And I believe it was through my contacts and um, writing funding proposals through the networks that I got from the Fulbright um, Award that really helped um, help the organization that I work with or, or that I co-funded to get all this funding as well as um, opportunities for grants and um, training and workshops that we could run back home. And had it not been for this amazing Fulbright Award, I would never have been um, introduced to these amazing people in the network that comes with it. And Lisa, right, and Lisa, but just to highlight, one of the amazing outcomes is that you were able to establish Tuvalu's only child NGO, is that correct? That's right. right. And then over to you in terms of your professional trajectory, which we always know, always knew was going to be sky high. How has attaining your MA been a part of the Fulbright program? How has that progressed your development? I really appreciate the program I was exposed to um, in Malibu and Pepperdine because Pepperdine is the number one dispute resolution school. So it's given me confidence in the field of arbitration, uh, dispute resolution, peace building, uh, mediation, because I hardly and rarely meet other international arbitrators here in the Pacific that are Pacific Islanders, uh, even international mediators. And so it's given me not only the experience and the depth of knowledge, the exposure that they've exposed me to uh, has given me confidence to do more work of that in the Pacific, and especially our region, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to uh, you know, human rights, or it, it even comes to property rights. It just allows you to mediate through any situation and with the skills of cross-cultural, uh, dealing with cross-cultural barriers, uh, all these other contexts. It's given me confidence to understand not only my culture better, but be aware of underlying factors when it comes to peace building in our region. Thank you, Anna. Elizabeth, I guess over to you. I know you're you're close to finishing your, your program. Are you already thinking about what you're gonna do next? Yes. Um, uh, as I mentioned, um, Tonga is currently uh, implementing its national marine spatial planning. Um, and that is something that I am interested in. And I think it is still in its early stage um, of development in Tonga, so I think it's a it's it's a it's a right time that I take this program because I see myself going back. I am an urban planner by profession. I have been an urban planner um, for more than ten years, so um, it's the same kind of work, um, you know, with marine spatial planning except for the spaces of at the ocean um, and Tonga, like. You know, um, the many, the small island states, we depend on our ocean resources for a myriad of, of reasons. Um, and now we are looking at other uh, things that we can harness from the ocean, like blue economy and all of that. So I envision myself when I go back home, I will do something along the line of, you know, contributing or building on our marine uh, spatial planning. 
as well as other aspects that we're looking at, like our ocean policy, uh, blue economy, and other activities that we have um, looked at in, in that area in Tonga. So that's what I'm leaning towards to when I go back home. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. So as you know, ladies and our audience that are tuned in this evening, the Fulbright um, foreign student program is currently accepting applications. The deadline, of course, is the 30th of uh, April, end of this month. We're currently accepting uh, applications. There are 14 fields of study to choose from. So do take a look at the details that is on our website. And of course, do follow us on our social media platforms on US Embassy Suva and US Embassy Nukolofa. Let's take you back, ladies, to that application process. Lesefa, starting with you, how did you find the application? What did you hone in on as the important things to articulate when you were putting your application together? Oh, Lesefa, you are on. You have to unmute. Yeah, sorry. I think it's really important, Maggie, um, that applicants those interested in applying um choose the field that they want to study and know why you want to study because there's no point in having all these fluffy words in an essay but they don't actually link to the development goals back home or even the development um aspirations between the us and your your country your home country so the, i think that's really important um know why you want to apply know how you're going to use the knowledge and the skills um, that you will obtain from this um, Fulbright Award. And I guess it's also a matter of knowing exactly how you will apply those skills and the knowledge when you come back home. So those are the three key things I think that um, applicants should really focus on when writing their applications and all the very best. <laughs> Thank you, that's a great takeaways there. Ada, for, for you, what were the highlights putting your application together? Yes, so um, just before you submit your applications, I know it's due at the end of this month, I would advise people or those of you that are interested, haven't started, have already started, exactly what um, was already said was do your research. You need to know at least a university that you are planning to undertake your studies in. Exactly know out of the pro uh, that have been listed, the listed fields of study that the US Embassy has uh, published, which one of those fields that you're interested in and which particular course that is in relation to that field that you will undertake. Um, another one is in your personal statement or the essay that has already been mentioned. You need to also talk about who you are. A lot of us Pacific Islanders, we're very shy when it comes to talking about the work and the fields that we do. Talk about, about uh, please talk about the facts, not the hope or the wishes that you wish you had. Uh, also talk about why Fulbright, the values of Fulbright that is in relation to what you're doing and how you bring that back to your country. Uh, talk about why that particular course, even bring uh, stories about your background and your journey, your career journey that's led you to that. Those are very important for your personal statement. Another thing that we tend to forget is our reference, uh, our referees, our references. For the Fulbright application, there's a certain date that your references uh, will have to be uploaded. So please, you know, take time to think, carefully think about who your reference uh, referees will be could be an academic a work experience one and the combination that you have decided that will give you the edge to support your application. Another thing is your documents that will be listed for you to upload. Uh, just have that also ready and sprinkled with a lot of patience and a lot of positivity because it is a process, the submission, then it'll lead to the interview stage and which will lead to after you get accepted the other preparation bit which i know will cover during the interview so that's just a quick uh tip for all of you that are anticipating to try and make that application or meet the deadline within three or so weeks thanks Meg. thank you anna some great tips coming through um lisa petty we need yours as well thank you i feel like um majority have been covered by lisa and anna 
But just in addition, I think one of the things that some people are doing is procrastination. So don't procrastinate, just start as early as you can so you can revise your materials, you know, and to write better essays and to meet the deadlines. Um, in addition, I would um, also support uh, in your application to be authentic. And what I mean by that, you know, be genuine in your application, share your personal story, your passions and aspirations. And like Lisa said, try to relate it to when you come back home, what you will bring back home uh, with you after you, um, after you gain the, uh, the degree from the US. I also focus on your accomplishments, like highlight your achievements, as Anna mentioned, sometimes the Pacific people were such, um, you know, we are a bit uh, laid back, uh, but we need to highlight our achievements in our leadership roles. That is very important in, our, in the community service and any extracurricular uh, activities that we are involved in. So the more you bring that in, the more, you know, points you have for yourself. Um, tailor your application. Again, as they have mentioned, uh, customize your application for, for, for the scholarship, um, highlighting the relevant um, experiences, skills, and achievements that directly relate to the scholarship's focus. And another, last but not the least, please do read you know, the requirements that all are given on the on the website for the Fulbright uh, website so that you won't uh, miss any um, instructions to avoid, um, you know, disqualification of your application. Thank you. That's some great tips coming through. Um, be authentic. Um, your why, why is your reason for applying for the program? And importantly, what to do with that newly minted master's when you do get back home. Some great takeaways there of putting that application together. And of course, if you are joining us, we are talking about the Fulbright program. We've got an amazing panel of alumni that's joined us, or two alumni and one on a way to being alumni. That should be, uh, that's what I should correct. And of course, the applications, are now accepting applications for the Fulbright program, which closes on April the 30th. Lisipa, if we could ask you, what were perhaps some of the challenges you faced when you were on your program? Well, I think um, because I was relatively very young, straight from my um, bachelor's degree, I went into my Fulbright um, studies. So obviously I was really homesick. And in fact, that was one of the questions they asked me in the interview. How would I deal with the new... Um, environment being so far away from home. And I guess it really comes down to you as a person, um, just be ready to be um, challenged in the new environment. I think the weather was what was really <laughs> bothering me <laughs> during my studies. <laughs> Indiana is cold. And when I mean cold, five of the 10 months was snowing. <laughs> so it was freezing. And that was not good for the island girl that I am. So I guess it's really about being able to adapt to the new environment, being able to be flexible about how you go about in studying, um, trying to fit in while also bringing home to um, America in your studies. So I always made sure that if there was any social events, I would rep Tuvalu either by um, doing a song or getting together and trying to replicate uh, food, make food, traditional food um, so that my friends and um, the staff could enjoy a bit of a piece of home. So I think it's always important because this is also not only just an educational exchange, but a cultural one so that we can always share um, what's unique about our countries in the US and vice versa. So yes, be, it, be ready to adapt to the new environment and be as flexible as possible. <laughs> Sticking, uh, Lucifer, with that with that cultural exchange, what was perhaps one of the biggest surprises for you, other than the freezing cold temperatures in Indiana when you were on your program? Um, well, I don't think there was many surprises other than just the weather was really an issue. 
I mean, Tuvalu doesn't have temperatures less than 28 degrees. And then I went to freezing cold. So the snow was up to my knees and that was really, really tough to try to study during the cold winter. I think that was, the, you, that was so did challenging. You take up, did you take up uh, learning to ski and all that snow oh, or definitely. Snow? Yeah, snowboarding. <laughs> That's great. And a same question for you is with your program. You happen to go to, to California and Malibu, though. What challenges, if any, did you have? Um, I was very blessed because, um, you know, I have my U.S. parents that are based in L.A. Shout out to Uncle Damon and Auntie Etta. So I, you know, whenever I had... Um, you know, I was missing home and the food at home. I would always go to theirs. They'd always, you know, pack my food so that I could take it back to uni. Uh, one of the challenges that I saw, I, and I think any food writer will tell you, is the accommodation, accessing accommodation before you start your university. So I was quite really, really blessed. Again, I had that family support. I had my uncle, uh, Uncle Damon Antieta, who found accommodation for me just before I landed. The second thing that, um, you know, for everybody to be aware is the US is big on insurance. And so I had to make sure that the insurance that I had for Fulbright really was in line with what the university requirement was. So that was two of the challenges that I and that I saw. And uh, but because I had the support that I needed, uh, the orientation was already there. You know, Fulbright uh, gives you an officer that holds your hand right throughout the, the journey that you have. That was two of the things that I saw that any food writer would uh, say, the bond that you have to pay for your accommodation, just to be aware of that. And, and that came down to planning, but those were the challenges. Other than that, I was really, really spoiled by um, Pepperdine University, the support that I got from there. And the fact that they always had student welfare as their priority. Thank you, Anna. If you are joining us, of course, we're talking to, this is our exchange alumni stories by the US Embassy. It's about the Fulbright program. And I hope you are taking notes because this panel are giving away many notes for you if you're applying for that Fulbright scholarship. We're talking about challenges at the moment and our current student all the way in North Carolina from the Kingdom of Tonga, Elisa Petty, question to you on challenges you may have faced while you've been a part of the program and how you've gotten around them. Thank you, Mickey. Um, I was all nodding my head when Anna was talking about that accommodation. And unfortunately, I'm on the opposite end. I'm on the, the East Coast while Anna was enjoying all the hospitality because majority of our people from the Pacific are in are on the coastal, uh, on the West Coast. So you can imagine, Anna, I'm a bit, um, you know, isolated here, but I've got amazing people at uni and, you know, classmates who have been tremendous in helping. But yes, I do, I, I stress that what Anna has mentioned about arranging the accommodation before I get here, because it's quite a challenge to arrange it from, you know, from the Pacific. We are, you know, uh, so far away from here in the States and, you know, getting to know your accommodation, to know a place and to secure a place will, will always be an issue. And that is something that I stress when I um, when I talk to uh, the Fulbright people here. Uh, but uh, luckily I've, I've been here before. So, you know, I, I was putting myself in the shoes of those, you know, like new ones who haven't been really exposed to outside countries and to a big state like United States. I think that is something that can be uh, looked at is to at least maybe uh, provide at least two weeks, I would say, uh, of accommodation, you know, temporary accommodation before you can have a feel of the place and, you know, and then you would start looking for a place of your own. So that was a big challenge that I came across uh, when I came here, but somehow I was able to sort it out and now I'm accommodated in a, in a, in a very good place, uh, close to school that was one of my uh, concerns was the safety uh, you know to stay near the school where you can uh, uh, within walking distance um 
And in this school here, I'm always asked, why did I pick UNCW? Why did you come here <laughs> to, to North Carolina out of all the states? And then I ask them, why not? Uh, and, you know, it's good to have different experiences now and then, you know. Um, so I uh, I do not really count this as challenge. I, I count it as stepping stone, as some learning experience that I go through. So I would urge our incoming, um, you know, scholars to, you you have to adapt, like Anna and uh, Lesipa has said, uh, you just have to adapt with the changes and you're only here for a short time, so you can take as much as you can before you go back home. So that's how I, I deal with these uh, sort of like issues. But like I said, I've been blessed with having um, uh, very supportive um, uh, lecturers, classmates. So I'm very spoiled in that manner because they, they're kind of like, I, I think they're more like curious. Uh, they've never heard of Tonga before. So every time I have to introduce myself, I'm from the Pacific. And then when they ask where the Pacific is, any countries that they would know. And when I say Fiji, then they are ah, Fiji. And I say, yeah, neighbor of Fiji, Tonga. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, it will always be an issue, I guess, for us in the Pacific, uh, you know, because we are a bit isolated from the world. Um, but like I say, you, you, take, you learn to take everything in and just enjoy the process while you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Can we ask what's perhaps been one of the biggest surprises for you? Uh, I think because I've been away from the classroom for, for, for a while and I was a bit surprised with the three hours lecture. Um, like, you know, in, in class, you have to sit for three hours. And also their semesters is different from us there. Um, we started early this year, like school starts, the spring semester, you start early in January. So, you know, right off um, celebrating uh, the new year and then we start on the same week. Um, but then that means you will finish early, you know, in that semester. So the, the system is kind of like different, but I, I love it. I love, I love it in that way. <laughs> good, good yes. surprises then. All right. Yes. Well, you're joining us for the Exchange Alumni Stories here at the U.S. Embassy. We've got our panel of alumni from Fulbright and current student. Thank you. If you are on our Facebook page, uh, do send us questions on Facebook. We uh, will send the, we'll go through those questions to we'll have that put before. Stephanie, if you can join us for questions, we've got a few coming in and we'll also um, put this to the panel as well, given their experiences. Before we get to our questions, Anna, for you, if you could tell us in terms of big surprises for you that you found um, getting back into that university life. I mean, where do I start? Um, you know, the culture is also, you know, they've never had a Fijian uh, um, attend that university as well. So even people meeting me and mistaking me for being Caribbean. Uh, so, you know, uh, I was also an ambassador for the Pacific and for Fiji whilst being a student at the same time. So that was a pleasant surprise. And then, um, you know, master's students is quite different from undergrad. So they've got a different program. They've got different, uh, um, like a different stature altogether. But in some classes we would mingle with the undergrads uh, when it came to cross-cultural mediation, some of my classes. So it was quite uh, interesting as well. Another pleasant surprise was because Fulbright is a very competitive um, scholarship, so the GPA is the emphasis. Uh, so you every term you have to send your results back to Fulbright uh, to continue your studies. So the other big surprise was knowing that I could keep up because I did the LLM in nine months. So just, um, you know, what our, what our Tongan sister was sharing is that, you know, that she started in January. My, my classes also were in December as well. So before Christmas and after New Year. So I had to uh, paddle through that. So that was a pleasant surprise in the sense that unless you went outside the classroom, you didn't know what date it was if you were in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> it was normal learning, you know, and she said she was shocked with the three hours. We did five hours because we started in the afternoon, ended up at 8 p.m. So I was even 
I shocked myself that I could stamina as well. It helped me when, when I'm doing hearings or when I'm doing arbitration because that's how long you can go for. It depends on the negotiation and how long it could go for. Uh, but <laughs> that was also ple a pleasant surprise for me, knowing that if you're having a good time, you wouldn't realize that outside that room, that life was moving on as, as per usual. So that was one of the, the other thing, I don't know if the other two ladies had this, um, at USP, you walk around like from place to place at the university, you went in the bus. So you, every 10 minutes a bus was going around the whole university. So that was really a pleasant surprise for me, especially when we're located on the hill in Malibu. Malibu is full of uh, mountains and hills. So having a bus, take you from location A to location B and being it available every 10 minutes. That was a very, very good surprise for me. Thanks, Anna. And Lisip, I think we've, we've got you back on. Uh, can you can you hear me? We're talking about some of the wonderful surprises. I'll just leave the camera off so I don't have any more technical difficulties. Oh, it's okay. We need to take a break every so often and technical difficulties is par for the cause. <laughs> we were just talking about some of the um, surprises and good surprises that um, you may have experienced on the program. The food. We got free yeah. food almost every day. Like you can, you don't even need to buy food in my uni. Oh my gosh. There was like a sign for free food for a special lecture almost every day. And it was always just like, pizza and subway and there was something else i can't remember but yeah free food love it <laughs> well that was probably to deal with all the cold as they well us. <laughs> oh, they well, you that was every lecture every lecture had to have free food if you had no free food you had no audience that's a really good segue because I did want to get to the food and the fact that you have the choice of everything and anything, a smorgasbord of choices. What perhaps, Elizabeth, let's go to you in North Carolina. What's been um, your favorite culinary delight? What's been a favorite food or new food that you perhaps may have tried on that end? Maybe as you can tell, Maggie, I'm a foodie, so... <laughs> So I'm not really you and I both. <laughs> I'm not really picky, but um yeah, yeah, uh there's quite what I've learned is that in different states you would have different, you know, um favorite food. So here in the South and um i I like to go with the local people here and just enjoy what they what they, you know, what they call um, the Southern comfort food and all of that. Um, I'm really, I'm not really fussy with food, but yes, they definitely have free food. Even in our, um, in our campus, I was surprised that we would have sort of like um, mm -hmm. a free store where you can just go in, you know, um, that they, they provide free food for the students. So any students can go there when you run out of supplies and stuff like that. I'm just surprised that they have all of that. But then this is America, so of course um, they would have that. Um, but as for the food, I I just um, go with the flow here and just enjoy uh, what they prepare and what they bring. Um, obviously here, we do not really have the Pacific food, you know, the, the food that we are used to in the Pacific, like the crops and all of that, but I'm surviving. Um, and, I, and I enjoy it. Yes. Have there been any any particular foods there, the comfort foods that you've been a little bit questionable about or suspicious to maybe have again? Uh, so far, no. So far, no, because there's just like, it's just a common food that we have, but just the way that they prepare it is a bit different. And, you know, they take pride in that, in, in that. So I am, yeah. I, I have enjoyed those, um, those, uh, those food that we have that they bring. Right. Well, there are no starving students on this program. Uh, Anna, for you as well, did you have any particular new tries of, of food when you were when you were involved in your program? Yeah, like California is a it's a diverse state, but I, I tried a lot of Mexican foods. Uh, lots of my friends love. Uh, their Mexican uh, menus. 
So I was with them whenever I missed Fiji food. I had my LA parents, Uncle David and Auntie Etta. So, you know, the Fijian cassava, the ndalo. So I was quite, <laughs> even though I was, I was, I was just blessed. Uh, and then my university um, really had for the law school certain black tie events. So we had combinations of, you know, the uni food and then the event food. Uh, and I remember in, at one time we had uh, George W. Bush come and speak at one of our black tie events. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've had good combinations. All right. Um, so the, the program is full on. It keeps you on the toes. You talked about lecture times being three to five hours in some instances. How do you balance it all? Getting, you know, getting an adequate, you know, school life, keeping those grades up, as well as enjoying the American cultural exchange that you're a part of. Lisepa, if we can start with you. Yeah, I guess it really comes down to just making sure that you have a proper schedule um, and sticking to it because I feel that since I was really new to the workforce, I just applied um, the work life to my studies. So I would wake up at eight, go straight to the library, even though it was still very cold and just stay there if I didn't have classes. As long as I was there until five, I felt good about myself. <laughs> But yeah, and then making sure that I went to all the social events so that I wouldn't miss out and I wouldn't feel homesick because it does get depressing um, if you become antisocial, you know. And, and with student life and, and balancing all of that, did you find a network at the university or different groups that helped you deal with some of that homesickness? Oh, uh, so we were... Um, during orientation, we were introduced to all the different um, associations. So there was Asia Pacific and the Pacific being me and a Papua New Guinea um, PhD student because the um, New Zealand students didn't want to be part of it. <laughs> but yeah, so we represented um, making sure that uh, I always went to all the Asia Pacific events. That was really fun. And it was really good because we all had... Um, a similar sense of humor and we were all foodies so it was really good i think that's really important to find a group that you belong to and feel at home to and just stick with them find your people and for you as well balancing school life um home life and in between working life as well so we're quite lucky um at the university at pepperdine uh gym classes are free for uni students so you could pick you know, box fit, uh, we, you name it, they, they brought specialized high achieving people uh, to take those classes. I did that. I also joined a netball team. I had to look for that. So I found one at Santa Monica. So about 20 minutes from Malibu, uh, because in our universe, you know, no people in America don't understand netball. Rugby is not that popular. So, you know, my university, they played golf, uh, other tennis, other other sports. So I joined a netball team and we met weekly every Saturday and we would go for competitions around Los Angeles. So I was very lucky to have that. I also volunteered uh, my university because it, it specializes in dispute resolution. I was quite lucky to also facilitate for the Los Angeles Police Department. And that was also recorded as part of my Fulbright journey. I also had the honor of uh, being with the professors to facilitate uh, workshops with federal judges from around the US, so on mediation. So I did volunteer work and I hung out with friends, you know, girl has to shop. So we did this and that, and I traveled. I actually traveled around California and, and um, you know, in between studies, of course. So that's what we well, did. So. I really needed it after the five hour classes. So that was my balance. Managing schedule <laughs> seems very, very critical. Um, for you, Alyssa Pesci, how is that going? Um, what they have mentioned, I resonate with that. Um, also in our school, our school is not really classified here in the States as a big school. So it's more intimate in that way. Um, we have an office here for international students. So we are very fortunate to have the focal point who regularly um, arrange um, you know, social events for us. 
uh, last month that I had my very first ever prom. So uh, it's pretty cool that they um, that they arrange activities for us international students. And uh, I'm not so lucky as Anna and and Lisepa to have Pacific colleagues. Here I'm totally isolated. Um, and international students, there are not that many international students here. So let alone people from the Pacific. But um, I have this group of friends, international friends that we sort of like hang out every, we have to plan for activities to do in sort of like every weekend, you know, just to um, get away from uh, schoolwork, you know, sort of like balancing the, the school works and uh, a bit of a social life. And what we will do, we will check out places here in North, in, in Wilmington, where we are at, you know, just to see, uh, because that's one of the things that I like, I'm sort of like an adventurer that way. I would like to check out the places while I'm in that particular um, state um to see some you know some places here in uh, in Wilmington so um and then of course the school have uh, various programs and various um committees and groups you know the support here uh, there is much support here and I guess uh being as Pacifica we are Moana people we can adapt you know to any situation um, we've come from, you know, across how many oceans to be here, so we can easily adapt to life here in, in America. Thank you, um, Elizabeth. So I want to thank you ladies as well for joining us this evening for our audience on our live stream on Facebook. Um, thank you for sending through your questions. Um, our team, of course, are trying to get to as many of them as possible. Um, this, of course, is the Exchange Alumni Stories for our Fulbright alumni. We, um, we're going to be wrapping up soon, but you know we could continue talking all night with a cup of tea, no doubt. Uh, let's go to Lisepa if you want to do a uh, final, final words for, um, for the wrap up. Thanks, Maggie. I just wanted to encourage those interested in applying. Um, again, I cannot stress this enough. Make sure that in your application, you also check out um, the US values because linking the values that the U.S. has to the work you want to um, do when you go home, as well as to the course you want to study in um, the Fulbright Award that you will undertake is really important. So check that out because with my application and I think in the interview, I had to stress how I really did believe that um, back home in Tuvalu, we didn't really have much um, freedom of expression and freedom of association when it came to climate justice because the government would just dictate that this is what we wanted. And back then, what I meant by that was the government decided for us without consulting us, the people, that we're gonna keep fighting for um, our country and we won't move. And there was no consultation, I mean, there's a whole bunch of Tuvaluans who want to move I mean and we don't have we didn't have that choice you know and I think that was one of the things that I really stressed because I wanted to know how to better articulate and to promote and protect these freedoms that we do have in our constitution coming from the U.S. and knowing how that is they they lead in protecting you know human rights and upholding um, those values of freedom. So I think that's really important that you hone in on, on the US values and how you would apply that when you do come back home in your application as well as your interview. And I wish everyone all the very best. Please do contact me. I'm on Facebook and I think they'll give up our email addresses maybe. Um, but yeah, I'll be very happy to help answer any questions. Thanks, Maggie. Vinaka and Fafitai, Elisa, but thank you so much for that. If you're sitting on the fence of whether to put your application, I trust this panel has helped you decide. And in the words of Elisa Petty, do not procrastinate, get to it. Anna, for you, um, what would you say to our prospective applicants? 
just do it. Apply. The fact that you're listening in means you are interested, you are good enough, put in that application, put in the supporting documents, read the requirements, meet the deadlines, please apply. You will not regret. And if you do have the honor of representing the Pacific in the United States through the Fulbright program, just focus. Remember, don't get, you can enjoy all the programs, but don't get distracted. The GPA is the priority. Thank you. Vinaka <laughs> Anna. And of course, uh, Elizabeth, from you, uh, what would you say to our prospective applicants? How could they be a part of the Fulbright journey? Thank you. Um, I think I would like to encourage my fellow Tongans um, to look at the government priority areas, because I noticed that the thematic areas on the Fulbright, it's sort of like, you know, they, they're similar in that way. So that's a good selling point for you to hone in in those government priority areas and in picking the particular area that you want to apply on and then just, you know, be authentic in your in your essays and, and in tackling the questions asked in this. Um, and as Anna said, uh, it's very important uh, when I was at USB, I was not as conscious as I am now of the GPA. And that is something that the Fulbright is, is, is pretty strong on. And I think that is very, that is, you know, instrumental for us scholars, um, because at the end of the day, we will benefit from it. So with that, I would like to make this, you take this opportunity to thank the Fulbright Scholarship for the Fulbright Program, you know, for affording me this opportunity to be here. And I am just enjoying my time here in the States, the program, the school and North Carolina. Uh, it's great to be here on the East Coast and just to experience um, life here on, on, on this part of America because I would always come here to the States, but also the West Coast. So this is also another pleasant surprise to be here in this state. Uh, with that, thank you so much for this opportunity, Malo. Malo Elisbeti. Um, thank you again to our panelists for sharing your time today, sharing some amazing hacks for those that are putting their applications together. We hope that this has been very helpful to you. Again, the Fulbright program is now accepting applications. The deadline, of course, is April 30th. You can follow us online on our social media platforms, US Embassy Suva and US Embassy Nukolofa for more on the Fulbright program, as well as on our website. Thank you for joining us as well, our Facebook audience, to our panelists, Vinakovaklevu, Malo, Fafitai, and good evening.